So, good afternoon, everybody. I will continue on the lecture about fertility. And I had stopped here on these slides about fertility changes in the US more recently. But before I go continue on that, I just wanna show you again that um, Excel file in which I show how to calculate a series of uh, fertility rates, just because I try to make it a little more clear here on row three, what we are estimating. And also in the midpoint of age group, I, I got a little confused when I was trying to explain this. So the correct way to estimate it is to get the age at the beginning of the interval here, add to the age here, and then divide by two. So in this case, it's 15 plus 20 divided by two, and the next one, 20 plus 25 divided by two, and so on. So you have exactly the midpoint there. And, um, and here I just put this, uh, the notations for each one of them, the population of women, number of births, this one is the age-specific fertility rate, which is the number of births divided by population of women. Here's the number of female births. And this one is the age-specific fertility rates, just taking into account the number of female births divided by the female population. And the number of person years, the number of years that a group of women in each one of these age groups, they lived throughout that age group. So if a woman lived all the years between 15 and 19, she will be, kind of, be counted five times here. And for this specific exercise, we had 100,000 women being alive. And that's, you're gonna better understand this column uh, eight on, on the mortality lecture. So if one woman who was born from this cohort here of 100,000 women, she entered, the interval 15 to 19, and then survive until the end, should be counted five times. If one woman dies at age uh, 18, so she will be counted only three times, three years. And this is taken into account in order to calculate the proportion of women surviving to the midpoint of the age interval, which is pretty much getting this total number of years that women live in this interval, divided by five times this number. And that's the notation here. And looked at these notations here, they are the same thing as the notation that we have in this slide for the uh, net reproduction rate, this one here. Um, so you have the age specific fertility rates only taking into account fertility of uh, female births, this one here, and the number of years that women lived overall within the, each one of the groups, this one here, and then the proportion of women who uh, lived through in that specific age group, the proportion of out of all of those alive, this calculation here is provided in column nine, the proportion of women surviving to the midpoint of the age interval. And then we get this one here times this one, we get the number of daughters per surviving woman during the five year age interval. So we are pretty much saying that if women were exposed to these fertility rates here that produced this female birth for each one of these age groups of women, and if we do take into account mortality, women would have produced this age specific fertility rates considering only female births and considering that some women are dying within these age intervals. And then finally, in this information we use to calculate the NRR, we add everything and then we multiply by five. And for the last one, the mean length of a generation, we also multiply by the width of the interval and the midpoint of the age group. So that's what we do here on column 11. So we get this column here and then multiply by five, which is the width of the age interval and the midpoint and add everything. And then finally, we have to divide by NRR, which is this one here. So what is the NRR giving us? That if women 
are exposed to these specific, these eight specific fertility rates, considering only female births, and considering this mortality of women, they would produce on average 0.904 daughters throughout their uh, reproductive life, considering their chances of dying. And on average, they would have these daughters around the age of 28.6. The woman would have these daughters here around the age of 28.6. And one thing that you might have noticed here on, um, on the Excel spreadsheet is that I, I excluded the age group 10 to 14 just to keep everything standardized across all these estimations here. So for all of these rates, I'm considering women between 15 and 49 years of age, including for the general fertility rate that I had done 15 to 44. Now I do everything here, 15 to 49. And I up, uh, uploaded this file again to our course website so you can see it there. But I just added these things and the formulas are all here. And, um, also added a formula for the midpoint of age group. And if you want to replicate that for another population in another year, you can simply type the numbers highlighted here in the cells in yellow and everything else is calculated, okay? And the, the rate of age specific fertility rates for the age groups that go from 15 to 49 are here. So this specific graph here is related to column five, okay? All good? Any questions? Cool? So the file is in the, in the course website already. So let's, let's just go back to where we were before. The, oh, today I can see the chat here on my on my window so if you want to ask a question you can ask through the chat you don't have to unmute yourself if you don't want to the um, um you're talking that the us has been passing through a lot of fertility changes fertility is declining a lot in more recent decades declining because of industrialization and urbanization and it's uh, below two, the overall national average. I mentioned again, the data from the Population Reference Bureau from 2018, estimating total fertility rate in the overall US around 1.78 children per woman. But that number varies across the United States as well. Uh, the, the rate of natural increase, it's of 0.4%. And that's actually the highest rate of natural increase of any of the developed countries. And um, because you still have more, a higher crude birth rate in comparison to the crude death rate. And overall, the US is passing through a process of uh, population getting older, higher proportion of people above 65 years of age. And that's um, because we have uh, lower fertility now, and then people get older, improvements in health, people live longer overall, okay? And the next topic here is about adolescent fertility. Adolescent fertility is usually considered, like we usually get information from the age-specific fertility rates for women between 15 and 19 years of age. And that's exactly that first age group that I was showing in the Excel spreadsheet just now. Why do we care exactly about this specific age group here of adolescent women? Uh, because whether these women, if women have children between the ages of 15 and 19, it will impact all their lives from that moment that they have children. Usually women who are between 15 and 19 years of age, they are in high school, they're enrolled and they're attaining uh, high school. And if they have children there, 
they that will affect their chances to end school and to have a better life in the future. So women who have children earlier in their lives, they will actually be more years exposed to have children. So they might have more children overall than other women who did not have children in earlier ages. And if they were in school, they will tend to drop out from school with higher chances of women who are not pregnant in such younger ages. And by not finishing high school and not going to college afterwards, they might have also uh, lower chances of getting good jobs in the future, so they lose economic potential, exactly because they won't have enough um, training, education in order to get good jobs. And the, adole the adolescent fertility rate in getting data from 2005 to 2010 uh, varies a lot across different countries in the world. Overall, around 48.9 women between the ages of 15 and 19 had children, considering a total of 1,000 women. So for every 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 19, 48.9 of them had children between this period here in the world. Uh, in developed countries, of course, this rate is lower, and in developing countries, is higher. But even within developed countries, it varies a lot. Switzerland, out of 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 19 in this period, they only, they experienced like only 4.5 births out of 1,000 women in this age range. In the US, 39.7 births for every 1,000 women in this age range. So it's much higher than Switzerland. So even within developed countries, there is a lot of variation. Bulgaria, 42.1. And in developing countries, it's higher than developed, but also it varies a lot. So North Korea, only uh, 0 0.6 births for every 1,000 women in this age range, in this period, in Niger, 209.6 births for every 1,000 women in this age group in this time period. So there is a lot of uh, variation in fertility among adolescent women in the world. And uh, so this is just to show the world average, the one that I showed before, the overall average in developing regions and developed regions, and then it varies a lot across continents. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the highest levels overall. And if you divide even more these continents, Middle Africa and Western Africa and Eastern Africa have the highest rates of adolescent uh, fertility. In the US, we have been experiencing a decrease in adolescent fertility since the 1940s possibly because of increases in the use of contraceptive methods. And among teenagers, there was a significant increase in the percentage of births to unmarried teenagers. So that, those are like two trends that are related to each other. First, you have a decline in overall uh, fertility among adolescent women, those between 15 and 19 years of age. But among those that have children, even in more recent years, what is happening is that most of them are unmarried. So out of those teenagers, adolescent women, who had children between the ages of 15 and 19, 14% of them in 1940 were unmarried. 89% of them were unmarried in more recent years. Why is this important? Because this woman, usually they won't have the support from their household, from their family, when they have the children. Okay, they might still be living with their parents, but they might ex actually experience issues with their parents, those that don't accept that they got pregnant in such a young age. And so they already 
experience those issues that we saw before, higher chances of not completing school, higher chances of not getting good jobs, higher chances of having more children overall uh, until the age of 49. But also, they might not have support from um, established household because most of them are unmarried. And there is also variation within the age group of 15 to 19. So if you look at the fertility rates of younger teenagers, those between 15 and 17, and older teenagers, it varies a lot. Of course, the chances for every 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 17, 12, around 12.3 births were counted back in 2013 in the US. And out of like 1,000 women between the ages of 18 and 19 in 2013, it was counted around 47.3 births. So you see a lot of variation. So most of the young teenagers having children, they are between 18 and 19. So when we are talking about um, socioeconomic and demographic indicators, it's always good to um, do this analysis disaggregated by race ethnicity. So adolescent fertility is much lower among Asians and Pacific Islanders, 7.7 .7 per 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 19, and 38 births among Hispanic teenagers, right? And uh, here in this next graph, we show exactly what I mentioned before. The birth rates for younger teenagers are lower than for older teenagers. Overall, these rates have been declining in these last decades. And this overall differential, I mean, it has not been changed as much. So the curves are still uh, far away from each other, most like in the same magnitude. Maybe here in these years, they got a little closer, but not much closer overall. They have been uh, decreasing in the same pace overall since the 70s. Right here, this one declined a little more than this one, but then afterwards they kind of like follow the same, the same rates, right? The same pace. And these are, these are rates of, of uh, teenage pregnancy, uh, teenage fertility broken down by race ethnicity. Among uh, Hispanic women uh, and non-Hispanic black women, teenagers, they had uh, the highest rates, I mean, the non-Hispanic black had the highest rates back in 1991, but then they also experienced decline. Every, all these groups are experiencing decline over time from 1991 to 2014, based on this data. And the Hispanic also explained, uh, experienced decline, but now more recent rates, they are higher than any other race ethnicity group. And like I mentioned in the previous graph, in the previous slides, the Asian and Pacific Islander teenage women, they have the lowest fertility rates, okay? And in terms of no marital fertility, here is just good to discuss a little bit uh, that fertility, like in the textbook, the, the, the author, he goes a little bit to explain that fertility of women who are not married, widowed, and those who are widowed or divorced used to be called illegitimate fertility. So the society did not accept as well women having children um, when they were not married or when they were already widowed or already divorced. And, um, and historically, marital status of, of the mother uh, is a special uh, indicator of whether they will have social, emotional, and financial resources. So culturally, having children when they were not married, widowed, and divorced, it was not culturally accepted. And 
affected possible um, family support and some other support from friends related to how it was not accepted by their culture. So they would have less emotional resources if they were not married. And as a whole, women who are married, and that's not true only to the US, to several other countries as well, usually they have a more stable life. Usually those ones who actually have um, a more steady education and then jobs, they tend to uh, have higher chances of getting married. But of course, uh, a lot of like really well-educated women, really um, women with like really high achieving jobs, they are not married as well. I'm just talking here about the average. Usually married women, they have higher levels of education and they have higher uh, paying jobs, right? So the, there is an association between these two variables. I'm not saying that there is a necessarily a causality between them. In 2013, 41% of no marital births out of the total number of all births, um, no, in 2013, there was like a 41% of no marital births out of the total number of all births. So that's actually a high number. So we start to see that now in society, it is accepted, it's more accepted for women to not be married and have birth and have children. So out of the total number of births that the US had back in 2013, 41% of them were no marital births. And that's an increase that has been happening gradually since the 1940s, when the percentage of no marital births out of the total number of births was only 4%. And again, no, no marital fertility varies a lot by race. Asians has the lowest, 17% of all, all taken into account in the denominator, all Asian births, 17% of them are no marital births. Among African-American women, out of all of their births, 71% of them are no marital births. But there is a discussion in the textbook too that highlights no marital birth includes birth to women in cohabiting unions and unmarried women not cohabiting. So there are two uh, groups of women here who whenever they have children, we count them as no marital birth. Unmarried women who do not have a partner living with them in their household or unmarried women but who have a partner living with them in the household, they are cohabiting. So whenever we are talking here that 71% of all births, 71% um, of all African-American births are uh, no marital births in the US back in 2013, we are not saying that all these women here, they are, by themselves in the, in the household. They are not married and they have no support for anybody else. They could be cohabiting. Their partner might be there, their partner might have a job, the partner might be contributing to the household, but it's just, you could still try to break that down if you have that information about women, but if you don't know exactly cohabitation, status of women, you have just to be careful about whenever you interpret this result, because this is not saying that all these women are lacking support of a possible partner. It's just because some of them might actually have the support of the partner. They might be uh, cohab um, might be receiving the support of the the, the partner in a cohabitation um, household. And also, some of these women might be living with their parents themselves. So the parents of these women might be uh, a support in terms of financial, social, and emotional resources, right? But it's just to have an idea of how these differentials vary a lot by race, ethnicity in the U.S. These are number of births, birth rate, and percentage of births to one married woman in the U.S. between 1940 and 2013. The overall number 
of birth, uh, the, the light blue line has been increasing. The birth rate overall has been increasing, the birth rate to unmarried women. So just to explain, the, the right vertical axis is related to the dark blue curve. That's the, sorry, the light blue curve, the number of births, births in, in thousands. So for this light blue line here, the, this is the vertical axis. For the other two, you have this vertical axis here. Okay, which is uh, per 1,001 married woman. And it's pretty much showing what we, saw, we said here before, increasing a lot uh, the non-marital births out of the total number of births from 4% to 41% in, um, in this one here between 1940 and 2013, right? And one thing that we have been experiencing a lot in, in these last decades is women deciding to don't have children at all. So that's pretty much women having no children voluntarily, but also involuntarily. And uh, voluntary childlessness almost did not exist between the 1950s and 1960s. And there is an increase in childlessness in the U.S. since the 70s. And it's exactly because women now decided to don't have children, just invest in their education, in their career, or just because they just don't desire anymore to have children. And overall, the culture has changed. So attitudes and norms towards a childlessness is becoming more positive overall with gender, with changes in gender norms. Right? And this is just to show that <clears throat> over time, exactly in after since the 70s, the percentage of women who did not have children, it has been increasing. But you also see that younger women have the highest rates because what might, might be happening here is that these younger women are delaying a little bit the age in which they wanna have children, so they, up when they are 34 years of age, they don't have any child, but maybe when they reach the age group of 35 to 39, then they decide to have children and that rate decreases. And, but it has kind of like decreased a little bit for all of them in this more recent year uh, for 2012 in this, in this graph here. But of course, this difference about age groups is exactly because some of these women are, might be postponing from 30 to 34 to 35 to 49. So this childlessness rate drops from one age group to the other. And, um, and then the last topic in this chapter is about uh, male fertility. Usually male fertility is not really the focus of ma major like most of the fertility studies do not deal with male fertility, just focus on information about uh, women. So we usually ask in most of the surveys uh, whether women have children, not much about men. And overall, there are some reasons why males have not been included whenever you're talking about studies in fertility. It's biological because men uh, have a wider range of childbearing years, not only from 15 to 49 as women, but from 15 to 79. And theoretically, there is no limitation of the number of children that males can have. So it just creates this really wide range of years that makes it more difficult to actually measure and to capture that information from men. Methodological. There is less data available for males than for females. Father's data is often missing on non-birth registration certificates. So usually if you're looking at registration data that we discussed in previous classes, in some cases you might have some birth certificates that do not have the information of the father. And even if you have a survey like the American Community Survey that asks how many children women have, if they ask that question, to men, 
In some cases, in some societies, they might not even know how many children they have because they might have multiple partners. And for women, the information is much more reliable. So in terms of methodological standards, the information of fertility for women is more reliable than for men. That's why usually that data is not actually uh, asked for men in most surveys. And in terms of sociological reasons, males are often regarded as breadwinners in more um, traditional conservative societies with little involvement in fertility except for impregnating women and women are in those societies more uh, doing uh, activities within the household. But as societies start to uh, have a more equity in gender norms and women entering uh, social life and getting more education and then getting better jobs, this sociological region, it loses um, its strength. Any methodological factors, you can start asking the questions in surveys in and trying to deal with uh, issues of misreport, misreport, misreporting data by men as well. So there are some three factors here that we discussed a little bit about the importance of why is it important to estimate male fertility. Within males, there is greater variance. Some men don't have children at all. Some men have a lot of children. So more vari variance within males in terms of fertility than within females. Marriage is a key determinant on having children among males. And there are also different patterns of male fertility. So just discuss each one of those here in terms of greater variance within males. Greater variance contributed by the male sex than the female sex to the next generation. As we know, most women they do have children. We saw in the previous graph that the percentage of those uh, not having children at all has been increasing these last years, but it's still most women have at least one child. But in the case of men, some men don't have children at all, and some have large number of children. In some decades ago, that was really clear in the case of the US and even all the developed countries and middle developed countries as well. But in developing countries where males, they have multiple partners, then the number of offsprings, it's really high. So it'd be interesting to try to understand those patterns, why some decide to don't have children at all, and some of them have a lot of children. Male fertility is likely to be influenced by the marital status and the employment status of men. Married and employed men usually have higher number of children ever born. So it would be interesting to kind of collect information about fertility from men so we can better understand the association about uh, marital status and employment status with number of children ever born to those men. And different patterns of male fertility, age-specific fertility beginning a little later among men. It usually, we show in the previous graph, goes from 15 to 79, but in some cases, I mean, mostly it's from 18 years of age. And um, compared to women, but the age-specific fertility rate stops at much uh, later among men than women. So it goes around 18 years of age or a little before that up to 79 as we saw in the previous graph. And male, uh, male total fertility rates are higher than female total fertility rates, especially in countries with male and female TFRs higher than 2.2. So this is, for example, the case of less developed countries or developing countries. In developing countries that have really high TFRs, usually that's exactly where you see countries in which women still don't have a lot of uh, rights as men have in that society. And men have much more power over women. And that's where you usually see more men controlling how many children the, the household will have. And on average, men have more children also because of the example that I mentioned about multiple partners. 
And in terms of cohabitation patterns, cohabitation patterns, they do vary by sex. There is a higher tendency of women to cohabit than men. Why is that important? Because like I mentioned before, usually people who are married have higher levels of education and higher levels uh, of earnings. But I'm not saying which one is the cause of which. Maybe exactly because women already have higher education, already have higher earnings, and already have a, a family throughout their lives that gave support to them, that will give them higher chances of getting married later in life. I'm not saying that by getting married, you get higher education. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about causality. I'm talking about association. And so it's important to see at the levels of cohabitation by sex. And uh, so women are more likely to cohabit. So this is a bad sign for women because since they are cohabiting, they will tend to have lower education and, and earnings than men in some societies. And this difference is more evident among women who previously lived alone, who are foreign born, so they don't have so much social network in, in, their, in the country where they moved to, and they live in fragmented families. So all these different dynamics that happen in the family, they also affect the marital status of people later in life. And also, there's, there are a different marriage and fertility parents by sex. There are stronger negative effects of educational attainment on fertility among women compared to men. So usually lower educated women are the ones who are going to have higher number of children. And the level of education doesn't predict as much the number of children that men will have compared to women. So for, for women, that effect is stronger. Um, so higher education, lower fertility among women, and uh, stronger negative effects of education attainment on fertility among women. So actually, if women, they are in a society in which they have higher chances of uh, getting good education, higher education, going to college, and so on, that actually will decrease a lot their chances of having children. So there is this stronger negative effect. Higher education for women, they enter, uh, they finish college, so their chances of having children will be much lower than women did, who did not finish college. And that impact of education on fertility is stronger in this opposite way compared to men. So just correct myself here a little bit uh, from what I said before. Unemployment is related to men's postponement of marriage. So men who are unemployed, they tend to postpone getting married. And a stronger religion effect among women than men. So more religious women, they will tend to have more children than non-religious women. And that effect is uh, stronger among women than among men, right? So just to emphasize here, uh, higher educational attainment will make women have less children, and that negative effect of having less children is stronger among them than among men. Cool. So we still have to do more research on fertility rates by gender to try to understand how fertility varies by sex and how parenting is uh, changing over time. And that has been some research being done. I mean, a lot of like studies have been done, but still there are a lot of like uh, topics that could be answered that we still don't know how uh, fertility and parenting roles are varying in different societies by for men and women. Right. So here I'm, I finish this topic about fertility, and um, and I will start now the chapter about <coughs> sorry about mortality. And just to emphasize in this um, in the course website, 
for fertility, so I, I mentioned at the beginning of the class today, I updated this file here, the Excel file that calculates the fertility rates. And for mortality, there are a series of different links here. This one is an article by the New York Times about child mortality in, in the world. Another article about life expectancy and that life expectancy decreased in the US after 2014. And that's related to the increase in drug overdoses in the US. The increase in drug overdoses in the US had a, more people start to die. And then that decline made the life expectancy declining levels. And there are a lot of studies saying that now the COVID-19 pandemic, because of all these deaths, of people that they were not expect to die. So in, in, in the ages where they are dying right now, that might affect the life expectancy too uh, within this, uh, this coming years. Or the current year, when we look at, at the data in one year from now, for example. This documentary here available on Netflix, I mean, focus a lot on Bill Gates. That's not my point here. My point about like highlighting this um, documentary, it's about um, there is a discussion of trying to provide better sanitation to developing countries, but instead of like creating all that really expensive sewer system that you have to go on the ground, put all the pipes on the ground and connect to the households, they are trying to develop some new technology that we will provide better sanitation to developing countries. All these things that we have here in the US and we take for granted, a lot of countries don't have that. And in, a, in this topics here in the mortality chapter, in the chap in mortality lecture about measurement of mortality, standardization and life table. I will explain here in the lectures what do they mean and how to calculate, how to do this standardization of mortality rates and estimation of life expectancy. Life tables are those tables that we estimate life expectancy. And I will show in these slides, but also the Excel files that I used to calculate those examples, they are available here in the course website, right? So you can just download these files here. Example of standardization and life table. I summarize them in these slides, but the Excel files are here. Some extra readings, and this is a, a um, uh, software provided by the, U, U, by the UN that you can just input some uh, death data by age groups there, and it already calculates automatically a series of mortality indicators. So this article from the New York Times, um, it just gives us information about child mortality, like mortality of children before they reach five years of age. And it has the trend over time, how it has been declining, but it's still a lot of variation across these different countries. So it's just an interesting article. I always really like how the New York Times, most of the time they summarize and they create some graphs and maps animated that make it much easier to understand some results um, from academic paper. So I like to see Sometimes this work that they do here. This is the reductions in child mortality between 2000 and 2007 and focus on specific countries and variation within these countries and so on. And this other article here about the US life expectancy decreasing and mostly due to drug overdoses. That's the, the paper that you, and you can download this paper, download the paper in PDF only if you are in the ANM wireless network or if you are from home connected through VPN to the university. But that, um, so you, the easier way is for you to come to the university, connect your computer to the internet here and download the, the full paper, right? But that's it. Because if you are from home and you click in that link, you probably will not see all this uh, information here, right? So, um, good, so let's just start here.
the, the lecture. Any questions? All good. Is this going to be a recovery day? Is that going to be on the exam Tuesday? Exactly. So Tuesday, we have our next exam. So I will not come to the classroom. You can just take the exam at any time between 1 p.m. and 8 p.m. On, on Tuesday. And the content will be whatever we start uh, discussing after the end of the, the previous exam until the point that I reach here today, right? And uh, all the rules for the exam are available in the course website, the number of questions, and then the time that you have. If you have any questions about that, you can ask now or, or also by email afterwards. Well, the, um, so here I'm just gonna introduce you the topic of mortality. And then here I'm gonna explain these different methods to estimate mortality, standardization and life table. Standardization is good compared different countries or different uh, regions that have different age structure for countries that some of them might be have a older age structure and but we still want to compare different countries we can do this standardization exercise. And life tables they help us estimate life expectancy at birth but it's really useful for other things as well for projections and so on and give a historic background of how mortality changed in the world and also talk a little bit about causes of death and then focus on mortality in the US and longevity in the US, focus a little bit on infant mortality and some speculations that are provided in the textbook about the future course of mortality. And there's like some references here about the, the coronavirus pandemic that might be useful for you. And I might make some changes to these slides um, before our next class, which is next Thursday, because we're gonna have the exam on, on Tuesday and on Thursday we come back to the lecture and um, I will make some changes just to update some of this data here to infant mortality as well. And I will upload it again to the course website. Cool. So the impact of mortality varies significantly according to social and demographic characteristics. So older people have higher chances of dying, men have higher chances of dying, um, African Americans in the US have higher chances of dying than no Hispanic whites. Um, people in lower socioeconomic status, they have higher chance of dying than people in higher socioeconomic status. Mar uh, unmarried people have higher chance of dying than unmarried and also places where you live have influences of, on your chance of dying. So whenever you're talking about mortality, it's good to examine whenever the data is available, variations in mortality by age, sex, race, ethnicity, social class, marital status, and place of residence. Levels of development, medical conditions, and um, series of other factors influence life expectancy. They influence mortality. And then by influence mortality, they influence how many years on average people will live. How many, people's, how many years people on average will live based on the current mortality rates is exactly given by the life expectancy that we estimate in life tables. There have been major changes over the historical record in main causes of death. People used to die mainly of infections and parasitic diseases. And today the major cause of death in developed countries are heart disease, cancer, and stroke. And the major cause of death are different in countries with high and low levels of life expectancy. So in countries like developed countries that have high levels of life expectancy, major cause of death are related to heart disease, cancer, and stroke. In less developed countries, they have uh, higher rates of deaths caused to infections, infections and parasitic diseases. But again, 
the coronavirus pandemic, what's going on now? It's an increase in infectious diseases, in communicable diseases, even in developed countries. So the US experiencing the most deaths in the world compared to any other country and with really high rates as well. So those variations, they happen in different years, but what we are talking here are major patterns that we have been seeing historically. But, and I'm not ignoring the, the recent issues of the pandemic, but uh, just saying what we have seen in these last centuries. And I'm gonna go into a more technical part of this chapter and uh, I will discuss uh, some measurement of mortality. The quantification of mortality is, a, is center in demography. We first have to understand how to estimate mortality rates and mortality indicators before we proceed to analyze mortality in a specific country. And the more measurement of mortality started with John Grant, who I mentioned at the beginning of the course, who is considered the father of demography. And he used data from London, historic London, and he published his work in the bills of mortality using data from London. Mortality refers to the relative frequency of deaths in a specific population. So that's what we are trying to measure. And um, two, there are two concepts that are important for us here in mortality, lifespan, and life expectancy. Lifespan is a numerical age limit of human life. It's the maximum recorded age at death. So in the textbook, and usually we mention this example of this French woman, Jean-Louise Calmen, that lived 120 years and 164 days. And, but like there's, I, I saw like recently a paper that was challenging a little bit this information about her, and I can put the link here afterwards. But overall, what we are interested here is not much on the specific example, but it's on the concept. So lifespan is that overall, no, uh, what's the maximum number of years that human beings can live? And that we get, try to get from examples that we saw historically in the world. And, in the, um, and that's related too to that last, of the last topics in this lecture about future course of mortality. Our lifespan can it still keep going up or there are some limits there. So there's some discussion about that and it's provided in the textbook as well. Life expectancy, that's what we usually measure using age, more, uh, age specific mortality rates. And it gives us the average expected number of years of life to be lived by a particular population at a given time. So the total fertility rate is the, 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 the rate that we got, we got the age specific fertility rate for all the age groups between 15 and 49 for women. We added them all and then multiply by five and said, if women are exposed to those age specific fertility rates, they will have on average this number of years. With mortality, we do get mortality rate by age groups as well, from zero until 85 plus or 100 plus, if you have that data. And based on those age specific mortality rates, you do a series of calculations and you're gonna say, if people were exposed to these age specific mortality rates, how many years on average they would live? That's what the life expectancy gives. So that data is based on age-specific mortality rates from a specific region in a specific year. The region can be a country, can be a state, can be a county, and so on, right? Depending on the data that you have. The easiest way to calculate crude death rates, uh, to calculate mortality rates, is the one that we already saw, the crude death rate. We just get the overall number of deaths in a year in a specific population divided by the population in the middle of that year, multiplied by 1,000. In the US, the crude death rate back in 2013 was 8.2 deaths for every 1,000 people in the US. In the world, uh, 
crude death rate that varies from one in the United Arab Emirates and Qatar to 21 in Lesotho. So just to show that this rate varies a lot and the US is in between there, right? When the crude death rates are compared among countries, some of these differences are due to differences in age composition. So the previous examples here, the US had a crude death rate of 8.2 per 1,000, and the United Arab Emirates had one death for every 1,000 population. 8.2 and one. So these previous examples mean that there are eight times more deaths per 1,000 people in the US than in the United Arab Emirates. Why is the crude death rate in the US eight times higher than that one in the UAE? The main reason is that the UAE is much younger in average age than in the US. The proportion of older people living in the UAE is much lower than in the US. So fewer older people, fewer chance of dying in a specific year because younger people have lower death rates. So whenever you are trying to compare these crude death rates across countries or even within a specific country over time, if they're passing through a process of aging population, the crude death rate is not appropriate. And usually countries with large proportions of young people and small proportions of old people have lower crude death rates in countries with small proportions of young people and large proportions of older people usually have higher crude death rates. And these ones here, so are usually the developing countries and these ones here are usually the developed countries. So it goes the other way around. The developing countries actually have lower crude death rates and the more developed countries have crude, higher crude death rates. So if you compare mortality based on this indicator, it's not going to be appropriate. So if age structure has changed over time, the crude death rate should not be used to compare the death experiences of the same population at different points in time. In the previous slides, I said it's not appropriate to compare the crude death rate between the UAE and the US because the UAE has a much younger population, high lower chances of dying, and then the crude death rate is necessarily uh, lower than the US. But if you are trying even to look at the mortality trends in, within the US over time, if you compare the crude death rate in 1960 in the US to the 2014, you see that it did not change much in between these 54 years. It dropped only from 9.5 to 8.2. So the crude death rate is not capable of capturing the reduction in mortality when the population is getting older. Because between the same time, the population in the US got older and older people have higher chance of dying. So it's not appropriate to compare these two numbers. The median age in the US, for example, was only 29 in 1960 and then 37 in 2014. So you have more older people in the US in more recent years. So the crude death rate is a crude rate. Why is it called a crude rate? Because it's the denominator comprised the entire population. It's not by age group, right? It's the same thing about the, the crude birth rate. The crude birth rate has the entire population in the denominator, all age groups, and includes both men and women. The problem is that the population members are not equally at risk of experiencing death. It would be more appropriate to estimate the risk of dying for specific age groups by sex, by race ethnicity, by socioeconomic status, and series of other characteristics. That just look at the first one, death rates by age. They, the death rates by age, they vary a lot. Because of that, it's appropriate to estimate the age-specific death rates. Demographers use the age-specific death rates as a more precise way to measure mortality. And the notation is similar to the age-specific fertility rates. 
So the eight specific death rates can be symbolized as a ASDRXN or MXN. And the XN, you remember, it's the, the age group going from X to X plus N. So that's the mortality rate for that specific age group. And this is the number of deaths to persons age X to X plus N. And P is the number of people in that specific group, age group going to X to X plus N years. And then you also can also multiply by 1,000. The notation of the, S, the age specific death rate, for example, for the age group from 15 to 19 is given like that, M15.5. So that's the mortality rate for people between the ages of 15 to 19, because they're talking about five years here, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Cool? And this is the example. This is an example of how Mortality is higher among younger children, those be before reaching the age of one. Once children reach one year of age, the mortality rate declines a lot and it gets more stable over time and then increases at older ages. And if you just zoom in in these age groups here, you still see some variations here that like it drops, but as people start to get older, in teenage years and then in more uh, young adults, they start to increase as well. And then it just keeps increasing in older ages, right? The standardization process, what it's gonna do, it's gonna estimate crude death rates based on age specific death rates. And the idea is that we are going to use the age-specific death rates and not the crude death rates exactly to compare mortality among countries that have different age compositions. Some of them might have more older people than others. Or I can compare the U.S. over time, the 1960 data to the 2014. We use this authorization to consider age composition when you compare death rates among different countries. We can compare crude death rates for different countries or years. The years is the really clear example here of the US. I can compare these two years if I do this standardization process. We need to adjust for differences in age structure. So we estimate this age adjusted death rates and apply to a standard population. So that's the exercise that we're gonna learn of standardization. Why we just not, we don't do with the age specific mortality rates, the same thing that we did with the fertility rate. What did we do with the age specific fertility rates? We got all the age specific fertility rates for women between 15 and 49 years of age, add them all, and multiply by five, that's the width of the age group. And that gave us the average number that, you, that women would have if they were exposed to those, that group of age-specific fertility rates. Why can we just not go here to this graph and just get all these age-specific fertility, age-specific mortality rates, sum them all, and if we have only five year age groups, multiply by five. What would that give us? If people were exposed to these age-specific mortality rates, they would die 2.1 times throughout their life. Does it make sense? No, right? That, because why? Because we die just once. That's the idea. Right? Women, they can have more than one child. So it's okay to add this and then multiply because that data makes sense. Women can have two children on average if they're exposed to these specific fertility rates. They can have three children on average. They can have four, depending on the country, depending on the year. But if we add the age specific mortality rates, the age specific death rates, and multiply, add them all, and then multiply by the, the width of the interval, we would be saying that people would be dying 1.5 times throughout their life if they're exposed to those rates. 
That does not make sense. Because of this, we have to use other techniques to compare mortality across countries that have different age compositions. Because of this, we have to do standardization. Because of this, we have to use life tables. Right? So that's the major reason, okay? So the idea is that um, young populations we tend to have low crude death rates, old populations we tend to have high crude death rates, and we pretty much estimate a variation of crude death rate that allows us to account for the age composition when comparing death rates of different countries. And the crude death rate, it's um, the age-specific death rate for people in that specific age group multiplied by the population in that specific age group divided by the total population times 1,000. And that's the original crude death rate that we have in another notation, right? Here, we have the population of people in each one of these age groups. 4 million, 4.1 million people between the ages of zero and one in the US in 2006, that represented 1.39% of the population. I get this number divided by this one. If I multiplied it by 100, I would get 1.39%. So this column here is calculated based on this one and it's supposed to add to 100%. So we're almost there. This is just because of um, decimal cases. And this is also observed data, the number of deaths of people in each one of these age groups. And how do you calculate the age-specific death rate? We saw even like in previous slides there, the age-specific death rate is the number of people dying in that specific age group divided by the number of people in that age group. So that last column is just this one divided by this, we get the age-specific death rate. Right, so these are the age specific death rate. And we, what I said before is that it would not make sense to add this all. If we add this all and multiply by five, we would be saying, oh, people who, I know that these are not like all of them are five year age groups, but let's say if they were, I would be saying that 1.2 times five, I would be saying that people in the US, if, if I get a group of people, and I expose them to these eight specific death rates that were estimated from the US in 2006, they would live, they would die on average six times. Again, does not make sense that interpretation. The crude death rate, the original one that we calculate, how do we calculate the original crude death rate? We just get the overall number of people and divide, sorry, the overall number of deaths divided by the overall number of people, multiplied by 1,000, we get 8.41, right? So this number divided by this number, multiplied by 1,000. And this number here, we calculated really simple, can be also estimated this with this other form, it gets the same result, which is pretty much saying that we get this number times this number, which is here, age specific death rate times the proportion times 1000 and then add them all. If I get this, multiply by this, put here, this, multiply by this, create another column, and then I add them all and divide by 1000, how much would it be? 8.41. Right, so this simple formula here is the same thing as this. Why is he showing this? To introduce the idea of age standardization that I'm gonna show in the next slide. This is the case of Venezuela. In Venezuela, there's the population. If I have, like in Venezuela back in 2006, 487,000 people were between the ages of zero to one, we divided this by this, we have 2.19% of uh, babies there. Number of deaths in each one of the age groups and the age specific death rates. 102,000 divided by 22 million, 
multiply by 1,000 gives us a crude death rate of 4.61. So see that the crude death rate in the US 8.4 is higher than the crude death rate in Venezuela, 4.6. Does it mean that the health standard and mortality is lower in Venezuela than the mortality and life standard, health standard in Venezuela is better and mortality is lower in Venezuela than in the US? No, that's because we have more younger children in Venezuela and fewer older people. By having fewer older people, you are going to have overall less deaths in Venezuela in a specific year than in the US. The US has an older population than Venezuela. Where did I get these columns from? From the previous ones. This column here, see 1.39, 5.48 is here. This one, 2.19, 8.0, 10.38 is here. And this is just the ratio. I'm just getting US divided by Venezuela. And we see whatever is below one, we have less people in the US. Above one, more people proportionally in the US and Venezuela. So the US has a much older population. So the cruel death rate is high in the US exactly because of this difference in age composition. And just putting this column here in, just putting this age composition here in a graph format is this graph. More younger people proportionally in Venezuela, more older people proportionally in the US. And the third column in a graph format is this one here. Fewer people in the US proportionally in younger ages, more older people proportionally in the US than in Venezuela. And uh, the overall age-specific death rates, you actually they are higher always in Venezuela than in the US. If you do a zoom in here in the Excel file in the course website, you can see that always the age-specific death rates are higher than in Venezuela. But the age-specific death rates were not taken into account to estimate the crude death rates. And that's what we do here now. We get the observed age-specific death rates from Venezuela. The proportional distribution of the US population. And then we just multiply one by the other. We are saying if this population here in the US was exposed to this observed rates, how, how, uh, how many deaths overall we would have? And that we get 0 0.0097 if we multiply it by 1,000, 9.68. So the crude death rate in the US, in, uh, in Venezuela, if we had this mortality here from Venezuela implemented into the US society, we would have 9.68 deaths for 1,000 people, right? This is just another way to estimate the same thing. And this is the final result. The crude death rate in the US, the original one was 8.4. We were wrongly saying that the rate, the mortality, that the mortality rates were higher in the US than Venezuela. When we got Venezuela, we got Venezuela mortality and applied the Venezuela mortality to this older population in the US, we got a rate of 9.68. And now we see, oh yeah, the mortality in Venezuela is higher than in the US. 9.68 compared to 8.41, okay? I know that this part here is a little complicated. It's good to, for you to check it, read the textbook, and we can, you can have like office hours individually if you want. But the main idea that we are doing is trying to create a measure that you can compare crude death rates between countries with different age composition. These are the rates of Venezuela. If we apply it to this older population, in the, which is the population in the US, then you have a higher crude death rate. 
you have the overall debt, add them all, multiply by 1,000, and then you see, yeah, the deaths in Venezuela are higher than in the US when we are taking in the same population. In this case, we already have the population in the US. In this case, we are taking the population in the US as the standard, right? We standardize the Venezuela rate using the US population as the standard. So the US population is the standard. It gives us a standardized rate for Venezuela. Cool. So the topic of the next exam is gonna be, it's gonna go exactly until standardization. And you can check the, the spreadsheet in the course website, and we will continue on Thursday on that, okay? So thank you very much, and uh, have a great exam on Tuesday, and I see you again on Thursday. Thank you.